Good morning and welcome. I'm Julie Sweeten, Meetings Coordinator of the JAZA Committee. Thank you for joining us today from near and far, even abroad. Welcome to our study morning as we focus on the fathers in Jane Austen's novels. We have a series of presentations this morning which will examine each of the fallible fathers in turn. How do their failures, misjudgments or neglect impact the prospects and destinies of their daughters? But to fully comprehend the significance of the key roles these fathers play in their daughters' situations, we need to understand the context of that era when male inheritance and power prevailed. Women, as shown in most of the heroines, and indeed Jane Austen herself, were often dependent on their male relatives, especially their fathers, for their financial security. Our keynote paper, Jane Austen's Fathers in Context, will explore these factors and their impact. We are privileged to have Dr Penelope Nash to explore this historical background of inheritance and responsibility. So Dr Penelope Nash is a very active JASA member and reviews books and papers for us. Penny is an honorary associate of the Department of History at the University of Sydney a historian of medieval Germany and Italy with particular interest in ruling women of the 10th and 12th centuries. Penny also holds a science degree and a master's in business administration and has held many government department roles. I'd like to invite Penny to now present Jane Austen's Fathers in Context. Sir Walter Elliot of Kellynch Hall, in the county of Somerset, took up the volume of the Baronetage at the start of Persuasion, Jane Austen wanted to tell her readers several things. Sir Walter was a baronet and a widower, whose ancestor had most likely bought his title from the Crown for a thousand pounds under King James I. A son was born, but did not survive. Sir Walter had three living adult daughters. He could will his landed property to a direct descendant. A nephew was the heir presumptive. The youngest of his three daughters had joined the second most important family in the county by marrying the eldest son, the heir of Charles Musgrove, Esquire, of nearby Uppercross. Sir Walter was spending more than he earned. He had mortgaged as much of his estate as he was permitted, which was only a small part of the whole. The rest was inalienable. That is, he did not have control over it and he could not sell it separately. We learn that having wealth and being of good birth were important, but that having one did not necessarily imply the presence of the other, nor the attainment of good moral principles. Sir Walter's financial troubles and self-centeredness were caused not only by the circumstances of the times, but also by his own failings as a man and as a father. The fallout affected the happiness and prosperity of his daughters profoundly. The summary of Sir Walter's problems and my paper serve as background to the summary of Sir uh, to today's individual talks about the follies and failures of four fathers of the main female characters and one father of the main male character in Jane Austen's six completed adult novels, with a lesser focus on Catherine Morland's father in Northanger Abbey. Also addressed later today is the impact of the deeds of fathers who had died before a novel's opening. I.P. Duckfield lists a set of three standards by which Austen assesses the competence of fathers, the provision of financial security, of education, and of moral principles. My paper focuses primarily on the financial situations of families 
in the late 18th and early 19th centuries in England and the laws and conventions that applied. The actions or lack of them by parents, particularly fathers in Austen's novels, determine the level of the affluence and the happiness of their wives, widows, and male and female descendants. Landed property, with its combination of wildernesses, forests, and cultivation, was the main source, but not the only source of wealth in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, the period when Jane Austen wrote her letters and set her novels. The income from landed property was not unlimited. Landed property was not normally owned by women. Inheritance of property was subject to a will and could be left away from daughters if there were no sons. Most women were dependent on marriage for a comfortable living. In the marriage stakes, the status of the members of the couple could be as important as their fortune. The discrepancy between wealth and good birth was a matter to be calculated. A significant difference either way was a good reason to deny a couple permission to marry. Let me present first the canvas on which Jane Austen drew. In 1790, the landed gentry and peerage were comprised of about 25,000 families, whose livelihood depended chiefly on the ownership of land. The average yearly income of the great landowners in England, about 400 families, was £10,000. 4,000 to 5,000 families received £1,000 to £5,000 a year, and the remainder less. Jane Austen's families in her novels fall, on the whole, into the upper and middle income groups, but generally exclude the peerage and the wealthiest landed gentry. The richest landowner, whose precise income is given, is Mr Rushworth in Mansell Park, who received income from his property and any other investments of £12,000 a year. The poorest is Willoughby, in Sense and Sensibility, with an income at the beginning of the novel of 600 to 700 pounds a year. Still handsome returns for a single man, 2,000 to 4,000 pounds a year, is probably the average income of the principal landed families in the novels. An idea of what might be considered a competence, that is a reasonable income, can be gathered from Marianne's remarks in Sense and Sensibility early in the novel. £2,000 a year is a very moderate income. A family cannot well be maintained on a smaller. A proper establishment of servants, a carriage, perhaps two, and hunters cannot be supported on less. Marianne is an unreliable witness, however. Her assessment cannot be taken at face value. Colonel Brandon, whom she eventually marries, will indeed have an income of £2,000 a year. In contrast, Eleanor and Edmund will have an income of £850 a year, which they find perfectly adequate. People with incomes from sources other than land are, of course, mentioned. Admiral Croft in Persuasion had made a fortune by the capture of prizes. Captain Wentworth is rich by the same means at the beginning of the book, and eventually we discover that he has £25,000. In Pride and Prejudice, Mr Bingley's fortune of £4,000 to £5,000 a year had been made in trade, and lawyers and clergymen are also well represented. Mr Collins already has a comfortable income from the living at Hunsford, John Dashwood is busy in closing land and buying property next to his own. He also cuts down trees, owns securities and has cash at hand. Like many others, he was subject to the vagaries of the wall economy and the unpredictable rise and fall of prices, although in his case, a lavish income should have covered all. Let us first look at the land of gentry. It is their characteristics that set the stage when we think of marriage and property. They are the eldest son, 
which includes the entailed estate and the wife's financial position, younger sons, daughters, wives and widows. Before the 10th century, the preeminence of the firstborn son was not by any means a given in England or on the European continent. The legitimate sons of the ruler and of the leading men who followed the ruler inherited equally. Wives and daughters could inherit too. Subsequently, land became divided among the sons until it was too small to be properly managed and to support the inheritor. As you might imagine, this did not promote harmony among brothers or between sons and their fathers. Primogeniture, the inheritance of the eldest son, became popular in England after William's conquest in 1066. It became the way to preserve the estate intact over generations. In replacing partable inheritance by women and men with primogeniture, families sought to preserve, build up and consolidate the patrimony. The consequences of those events was that women's power through land ownership and inheritance started to decline. Does this sound familiar? For the landed gentry, the basic source of income, the family estate, was usually entailed. The object of entailing the estate was to preserve the family fortune from one generation to the next by preventing its being sold or divided among the children. The preservation of the estate was achieved by using legal devices in a will or settlement to ensure that in each generation the titular ownership was in the hands of one person who had no power to sell it or dispose of it by will. Ownership was made to consist merely of the right to receive the income. It has been estimated that in the 18th century, half or more of the country was held under settlements of this kind. The eldest son or other senior male relative, if there were no son, was the person most often selected to hold the estate, usually as a life tenant. A daughter could sometimes inherit and was then described as an heiress. I see no occasion, says Lady Catherine de Verde, for entailing estates from the female line. It was not thought necessary in Sir Louis de Burgh's family. Such independence was not possible for most of Jane Austen's female characters. We will consider some of them individually later. The strict settlement preserved the family estate. It secured its income to one individual, but naturally the landed gentry consisted not of individuals, but of families. On his father's death, the eldest son was secure. However, the system of entails posed a problem with regard to providing for the widow, the younger sons and the daughters, all of whom, for various reasons, imposed a considerable financial burden on the family estate. Jane Austen most fully examines the effect of the entail in Sense and Sensibility. Henry Dashwood the Elder left his wealthy estate to his son, who died within 12 months of inheriting. His son, from a first marriage, John Dashwood, received the manor, lands and money of his father, mother and bride, valued at between 100,000 and 120,000 pounds. The widow and three daughters by the second marriage received in total with all the legacies 10,000 pounds. The income of John Dashwood, his wife and small son, was between 5,000 and 6,000 pounds per year. The income of the four ladies at the normal 5% interest rate was £500 per year. The only goods that they were legally permitted to take with them when they left their family home were china, plate and linen. Those differences in outcomes within a family were quite common and perfectly legal. While Jane Austen's father, George Austen, 
lived in retirement, the family had an income of £600. After Mr Austin died, Jane, her sister and mother, had the sum of £460 on which to live, a sum comparable to that of Mrs Dashwood and her three daughters. Martha Lloyd joined the Austin household. Together, the women suffered under other financial hardship. Jane Austen reports in her letters upon the economies that they have to make and the social stigma to be endured at Southampton. Jane, uh, Jane's brother Edward, who was adopted while young by the wealthy Knight family, did not organise the settlement of the four ladies at his property at Chawton Cottage until over three years after George Austen's death, almost immediately after George Austen's wife died. Jane lost 50 pounds when her brother Henry went bankrupt. Her brothers James, Frank and Henry and her uncle lost considerable sums. Frank and Henry were unable to continue their annual gifts, 50 pounds each to their sisters and mother. Seven years later, Jane Austen's uncle left no money to his sister, Mrs Austen, or to her daughters. And there's another tale in that which is interesting. Those adversities endured by Jane Austen and her family echo those of the Dashwood ladies in the fictional sense and sensibilities. The position of the younger sons is the second factor that made marriage an economic institution. It was determined partly by the entail and partly by another convention equally important for an understanding of the connection between property and marriage. This was that the landed gentry and their families voluntarily precluded themselves within certain limits from earning money. Trade in which there was plenty of money to be made was regarded by the upper and middle ranks of the landed gentry with the utmost horror. I am a gentleman's daughter, says Elizabeth Bennet to Lady Catherine de Bourg. True, is her reply. You are a gentleman's daughter, but who was your mother? Who are your uncles and aunts? Do not imagine me ignorant of their condition. Elizabeth's mother was the daughter of a lawyer, and lawyers, unless members of the bar, were more or less in the same category as traders. One uncle had succeeded his father in the business and the other was in trade. Elizabeth's father was a gentleman because he derived his income from the ownership of land. Austen presents Mr Gardner as a better father and in practice more of a gentleman than Mr Bennett, although Mr Gardner lived by trade and in sight of his warehouses. Many instances could be given from all the novels of this attitude towards trade, but there were nevertheless two connecting links between the landed gentry and the commercial interest. A wealthy trader could purchase an estate, as Mr Bingley's father had hoped to do, and his daughters might, and frequently did, marry into the landed interest. Lady Middleton and Mrs Palmer Mrs Jennings's two daughters in Sense and Sensibility are examples of this. But the sons of the upper and middle ranks of the landed gentry rarely engaged in trade and the daughters would not normally marry into it. Miss Churchill in the novel Emma, who did so in becoming Mr Weston's first wife, was disowned by her family. Thus the movement was one way only one class could be raised, but the other refused to be lowered. The male members of the land gentry did not exclude themselves from the professions, but a career in these was limited in three ways. A considerable financial outlay was usually needed to enter them. They could not be relied on to uh, produce a suitable income, and only four occupations were included the army, the navy, the church and the bar. So you are to be a clergyman, Mr Bertram, says Mary Crawford in Mansfield Park. This is rather a surprise to me. Why should it surprise you? 
You must suppose be designed for some profession and might perceive that I am neither a lawyer nor a soldier nor a sailor. The establishment of younger sons, whether in the church or the other professions, necessitated a financial outlay, usually from the family estate. Younger sons could hardly improve their financial position except by marriage. He could only get income from the limited employment considered open to them. But the wife contributed her portion at their marriage. Younger sons cannot marry where they like, says Colonel Fitzwilliam to Elizabeth Bennet. Our habits of expense make us too dependent. The Colonel is a younger son of an earl. They continue to talk flippantly about how much the fortune of an heiress needs to be to match his value and settle on not above £50,000. This is Jane Austen's exaggeration and joke. Up to 1800, marriage portions seldom exceeded £30,000, even for the grandest matches between aristocratic families. £50,000 would be very generous for even the eldest brother who would inherit the earldom. The position of the daughters was governed by the third important convention, the marriage portion. There was no question of the daughters earning anything, but a portion was intended not so much to give financial independence as to enable them to make a suitable marriage. The novels contain a great deal of information about the size of the portions, which was usually fixed in the marriage settlement of the girl's parents. In the Regency period, the widow could be provided for by what was known as a jointure. Since the husband could not usually leave the estate to her, the person next in succession had to pay an annuity to her. The amount of the annuity would already have been fixed in her marriage settlement. He will be glad of the jointure, says Tom Bertram in Mansfield Park. He is referring to a male friend of his whose grandmother had just died. How large this annuity was would depend partly on the annual value of the estate of the deceased husband and partly on the money contributed to the marriage settlement by the wife that that latter money was known as a portion, as I have mentioned. The deceased woman that Tom Bertram refers to is a dowager, that is, a widow with money or property. The assumption is that following her death, the money would revert to her descendants. If the recently deceased grandmother were Lady Ravenshaw's mother, the sum would presumably be left to Lady Ravenshaw and therefore automatically becomes her husband's property, not hers. Consequently, Lady Ravenshaw misses out on her mother's positions altogether. Here we have then the first of the factors that make marriage an economic institution. The wife's financial position, if she became a widow, depended to some extent on her own resources, however large her husband's income might have been. In a few compact sentences, Jane Austen presents the advantages and disadvantages to women of the jointure. The jointure was an income that had its origins in the marriage portion, as I have mentioned, but formally the word applied to the holding of property to the joint use of husband and wife for life or entail, that is the entail, as a provision for the wife during widowhood. By the 15th century, the jointure meant a sole estate limited to the wife to take effect upon the death of her husband for her own life at least. In Jane Austen's day, a widow's jointure could be paid instead of the previous dower. The jointure, which was frequently badly managed, was set at 10 to 20% of the woman's portion, whereas the dower now superseded calculated at the rate of one third of the husband's income, often gave the widow larger amounts. The highest marriage portion mentioned in the novels is that of the independent Miss Grey in Sense and Sensibility, who had 50,000 pounds. 
a very great fortune indeed, as I have mentioned before. Some had much less than this. Mr. Bennett's daughters had only £1,000 each. Mrs. Jennings, a widow, enjoys a jointure which must have derived from her known portion. John Dashwood knows that he should have given more money to his half-sisters and his father's widow, Dashwood's step stepmother, on their father's death. He is under no legal obligation to do so, however. He hopes that Mrs. Jennings will leave her jointure to his half-sister Eleanor rather than to Mrs. Jennings's two well-married daughters. Eleanor states sensibly that she is more likely to leave it to her own daughters. In the first edition of Sense and Sensibility, Jane Austen has John Dashwood and Eleanor discussing Mrs. Jennings's furniture rather than her jointure. Mrs. Jennings could give furniture, which was personal property, to anyone, but not her jointure. A jointure must, by law, descend to Mrs. Jennings's daughters, and since they are married, it will go to their husbands. In changing the word from furniture to jointure in the second edition, Jane Austen's contemporary readers would understand the passage of the money and the fragility of and restrictions on female wealth and inheritance. The characters in Jane Austen's novels almost always know very precisely the fortunes and incomes of their friends, neighbours and acquaintances. Why were the landed gentry prepared to spend such large sums on portions for their daughters, an expense that was merely taking money out of the family? A possible explanation is that the entail and the partial bar on employment made such a system necessary because there was almost no other way in which they could maintain or increase their financial resources. Although the particular portion given did not result in an immediate benefit to the family that gave it, the system must, in the long run, have benefited the class as a whole because it provided circulating capital for people whose incomes were usually static. Moreover, the custom of giving portions must itself have created the need for more capital, as well as providing it. Widows, younger sons, and above all daughters, all placed a financial burden on the owner of the entailed estate, who usually held it subject to making the necessary provision for them. A landowner who got into financial difficulties or who wished to increase or even maintain the wealth and position of the family might often be in as much need of a wealthy marriage as his younger brothers. A marriage created much more than a relationship between two people. It was also an alliance and bargain between two families. The more one family could offer, the more was expected of the other in exchange. When Isabella Thorpe, who had practically no portion at all, became engaged to James Morland in Northanger Abbey, his father proposed to resign in his son's favour a living worth £400 a year and to settle an estate of equal value on him for the future. You know, my dear, says Mrs Thorpe to her daughter Isabella, we are not to suppose but what if you had had a suitable fortune, he would have come down with something more. This remark illustrates very well what may be called the doctrine of the equal alliance. As in any bargain, it might reasonably be supposed that one side could try to get the better of the other, and the argument of the family that felt it was giving most and receiving least was that the alliance was not an equal one. When Maria Ward, with only £7,000, married Sir Thomas Bertram, all Huntingdon exclaimed on the greatness of the match, and her uncle, the lawyer himself, allowed her to be at least £3,000 short of any equitable claim to it. In other words, Sir Thomas's income and social position, and probably the provisions for jointure and portions, which he guaranteed in the marriage settlement, 
corresponded to an expected contribution from the bride's parents of £10,000, which, as we see, had not been sure. John Dashwood, in Sense and Sensibility, discusses with Eleanor the possibility of Edward Ferrers marrying the honour Honourable Miss Morton, who has a fortune of £30,000. Miss Morton will earn approximately £1,500 per year from her fortune. Under this arrangement, Mrs Ferris will settle £1,000 per year upon Edward as eldest son. Mrs Ferris would consider this marriage a prized alliance with the aristocracy. Miss Morton could realistically anticipate that Edward, as eldest son, would increase his income by inheritance above his annual income of £1,000. From a monetary point of view, the alliance is well balanced. Jane Austen continues to reveal the absurdity of the marriage market later in the novel. Edward loses the favourism of his mother when he refuses to marry Miss Morton and his engagement to Lucy Sharp is revealed. Mrs Ferrers disinherits him, his younger brother Robert, will now come into the family fortune. John and Eleanor Dashwood discuss the situation. We think now, said Mr Dashwood, of Robert's marrying Miss Morton. Eleanor, the lady, I suppose, has no choice in the affair. John Dashwood, choice? How do you mean? Eleanor replies, I only mean that I suppose from your manner of speaking, it must be the same to Miss Morton, whether she married Edward or Robert. John Dashwood. Certainly, there can be no difference, for Robert will now, to all intents and purposes, be considered as the eldest son. And as to anything else, they are both very agreeable young men. I do not know that one is superior to the other. We may also remember that Lady Bertram in Mansfield Park was of the same persuasion as Mr. Dashwood when Fanny refused the offer of marriage by Henry Crawford. You must be aware, Fanny, that it is every young woman's duty to accept such a very unexceptionable offer as this. Perhaps after all, we should have some sympathy for two of Jane Austen's female characters upon whom we normally look with disdain. Dare I say it, the avaricious Lucy Steele in Sense and Sensibility and Mrs Clay in Persuasion. Lucy could obtain money legitimately only by marriage and she had no portion to bring to one. Mrs Clay was the daughter of an attorney and a widow with two children to support. Lucy's and her sister's sycophantic wooing of the wealthy Mrs Ferrers and Fanny and John Dashwood is understandable. Similarly, Mrs Clay's ingratiation of herself with Sir Walter and Elizabeth and, Elizabeth, and then the future heir, Mr Elliot, is also understandable. The two cases are no different from that of Mr Collins's wooing of Lady Catherine in the hope of gaining an extra living or two. The financial systems of Lucy and her sister and of Mrs Clay are indeed far worse than that of Mr Collins, who already has a comfortable living from Lady Catherine. Much as I dislike to say it, should we criticise these women more harshly than we do Mr Collins? As we have seen, younger sons of the aristocracy and the gentry in the late 18th and early 19th centuries could have careers in the military, in the law and in the church. In earlier times in England and on the European continent, inheritance processes allowed widows and daughters to inherit via a three-generation contract, not just sons and some grandsons. Again, Shades of the entail, but with heritability by a woman. By Jane Austen's time, such opportunities with their attendant authority, affluence and status, were generally not available to women of the gentry and aristocratic classes. Austen illustrates in her works and letters 
the difficulties for many women of the late 18th and early 19th centuries to accumulate sufficient wealth to live a reasonably comfortable life. Men controlled the finances. Women's lives were circumscribed by the few options to earn money so that a marriage with adequate financial resources became a key aim. Primogeniture kept fortunes within the family, but together with the entail, favoured firstborn sons to the detriment of younger sons and especially of daughters. The merits or failures of Jane Austen's fathers affected the wealth and happiness of their families. Unforeseen and disastrous consequences often eventuated. Many of the habits and restrictions of Jane Austen's time had their roots in earlier times, but hers seems to have been particularly hard on women. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Penny. That was absolutely fascinating. And it's really set the scene for us so we can now consider these fathers in Jane Austen's novels. And the first of those we're going to look at is Mr Bennett from Pride and Prejudice. So Charles Gillen is going to um, explore that for us. Charles is a retired lawyer, has been a JASA member since 2017 and is committed to encouraging more men to read Jane Austen. Post-retiring, he has pursued reading 19th century literature, singing, music, and still life painting. So I'll ask Charles now to present to us on Mr. Bennett. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Let's meet Mr. Bennett, Jane Austen's remarkable literary example of how not to be a father. I'll begin with some background, Mr. Bennett. Austen doesn't reveal his first name, nor give any physical description, nor his age. But we can infer from his five daughters' ages and his being married 23 years that he may be in his late 40s. A member of the landed gentry, he owns Longbourn, a farming estate in Hertfordshire near the fictional village of Meryton. The property is entailed down the male line to the detriment of his wife and five daughters. Consequently, his first cousin, once removed, William Collins, is due to inherit Longbourn. Poor Mr. Bennett made a foolish marriage. Austen writes that captivated by youth and beauty, Mr. Bennett married a woman whose weak understanding an illiberal mind had very early in the marriage put an end to any real affection. Respect, esteem, confidence vanished forever. He enjoys living in the country. He enjoys reading. He takes sanctuary in his library and amuses himself making fun of his wife, his daughters and their various social circle. In his own words, for what do we live but to make sport for our neighbours and to laugh at them in return? When we, we first meet him, we laugh at his teasing of his wife and daughters. But as the novel progresses, Austen gradually reveals that behind this wit and sarcasm there is a deeply flawed man who has totally failed in his duty as a parent. Because Austen gives Mr Bennett much of the funniest dialogue in the novel, the reader can easily be beguiled from judging too closely his actions and character. Unlike men such as Ferrers, Knightley and Brandon, of whom it is said, they would never knowingly cause pain to another. Mr. Bennett not only causes pain, but he often enjoys it. He enjoys ridiculing his wife, mocking her in front of his daughters. We are repeatedly shown him as being callous to Mrs. Bennett, 
Lizzie sees this behaviour as highly reprehensible, exposing his wife to the contempt of her own children. What, what a terrible thing to do to your wife. This conduct as a husband is reflected in his behaviour as a father. He has a similar attitude towards his daughters. He enjoys deriding them to their faces as silly girls, but makes no attempt to improve them or to try and understand how he may have contributed to their characters. Escaping to his library, he is delinquent in his duty as a father, neither giving his daughters guidance nor setting boundaries. In Lizzie's words, not giving any attention to what was going forward in his family. Instead of any attempt to give his teenage daughters good sense and moral principles, to instruct them in what Lizzie calls serious subjects, he writes them off as irredeemably silly. As Lizzie reflects, her father, content to laugh at them, would never exert himself to contain the wild giddiness of his youngest daughters. What an appalling attitude for a father. And this neglect results in a disaster. His most consequential failure is making no attempt to provide financially for the future of his wife and daughters. With his plans for a son dashed, he now regrets that he didn't save an annual sum for their future provision. But alas, the chickens have now come home to roost. It, it can be difficult for modern readers to fully appreciate the frighteningly precarious state that Mr. Bennett's death will leave his wife and daughters in. The combination of the entailment and the prevailing economic powerlessness of women make Mr. Bennett's delinquent neglect of his duty particularly deplorable. And remarkably, he still has no plan to protect their future. On Mr. Bennett's death, his wife and his daughters may be left homeless at the whim of Mr. Collins. The entailment has left their fates in the hands of an irresponsible father and a foolish distant cousin. We laugh with Mr. Bennett at his mocking of his wife's desperate scheming for rich husbands for her daughters, but it's actually a rational solution to their problem. He certainly has no better solution and Austin gradually reveals that his feelings of superiority to all those around him who he looks down on, Mr. Bennett is lazy, he's selfish, he's irresponsible, and he's nowhere near as smart as he thinks he is. Apart from marrying foolishly, he is as totally mistaken about Wickham and Darcy as everyone else at Meryton and he stupidly entrusts Lydia to Colonel Foster and his young wife, farming off his own responsibility to them. The only one of his family who he seems to deeply care about is Lizzie, with whom he shares his wit and his sardonic view of humanity. But even for the beloved Lizzie, this lazy man will do little to exert himself. He tells her to write to him, but only almost promises to write back. It's unsurprising that in Darcy, Lizzie marries a man who is totally the opposite of her father. And she actually has to look inside herself and lose some of the qualities in which she is similar to her father. In his most disastrously neglectful decision, Mr. Bennett takes the easy way out 
when Lydia pesters him to be allowed to go to Brighton. He gives in to keep a quiet home life. And he takes no heed of Lizzie's pleading that Lydia's behaviour has already tainted her sisters. And unsupervised in Brighton, she could disgrace them completely. Instead, he humorous, humorously <laughs> belittles Lizzie's prescient warning. Other characters seem fully aware of Mr. Bennett's uselessness and irresponsibility. His brother-in-law, Mr. Gardner, encourages Mr. Bennett to go home from London and leave him to handle things. And when Darcy tracks down Lydia, he waits until Mr. Bennett has left London before consulting with Mr. Gardner. Can there be a greater condemnation of a man then in such a desperate situation, Darcy chooses to avoid even talking with Mr. Bennett and instead actually waits for him to leave so he can deal with his sensible brother-in-law alone. Even the odious Collins sneers at Mr. Bennett's failure as a father. He writes to tell him that Lydia's licentious behaviour has proceeded from a faulty degree of indulgence. And he gloats in how lucky he was to have escaped marriage into the Bennett family. Even the lovely Jane, who never thinks ill of anyone, remarks that her father can't be trusted to act sensibly. And Lizzie laments to her aunt and uncle that Wickham would never have dared run off with Lydia if Wickham didn't know how indolent and negligent Mr. Bennett is as a father. Lizzie's wise insight highlights the terrible irresponsibility of her father's refusal to control Lydia. Their one hope for economic security through suitable marriages now is close to doomed, the consequences of Mr. Bennett's delinquency would have been catastrophic if not for the intervention of Fitzwilliam Darcy. Now, like most of her great characters, Mr. Bennett is a man of mixed parts and Austen does give him some admirable qualities and actions. He is articulate and quick-witted he is not pretentious or roared by social status or wealth. Lizzie recognises his talents, but laments that they weren't used for the improvement of his daughters. And he supports Lizzie in rejecting Collins. And in a poignant scene, he warns Lizzie against making the same mistake he made and marrying Darcy for the wrong reasons despite the, the huge benefits to the family that would have accrued from this marriage. <laughs> and any man who has two daughters like Jane and Lizzie must have done something right. And he has at least provided a formal education for his daughters, albeit without a governess or any discipline. As Lizzie tells Lady Catherine, such of us as wished to learn never wanted the means. We were always encouraged to read and had all the masters that were necessary. Those who chose to be idle certainly might. Attention, Kitty and Lydia. But his selfish indolence and his delinquent failure to live up to his duties as a father outweigh all else. It is said that circumstances reveal character. And with the Wickham Lydia crisis, Austin strips Mr. Bennett's character bare. It's gobsmacking that he is so thoughtless 
that he doesn't write at all to his family when in London, other than to give his address, leaving them all in a turmoil of worry. And after his failure to find Lydia, he returns home spiritless, remorseful. He admits to Lizzie, Lizzie how much he is to blame, but he tells her, don't worry, the remorse will pass away soon enough. This pathetic conf confession reveals that he is fully self-aware of his flaws and failures, but won't take any action to improve himself. In Austin's words, when the first transports of rage which had produced his activity in searching for Lydia were over, he naturally returns to his former indolence. His chief wish is now to have as little trouble in the business as possible. And it comes as a very welcome surprise when he learns that it's Darcy who has paid off Wickham, relieving him from any obligation to repay Mr Gardner. Austen is masterly at using her characters to provide moral lessons. With Mr. Bennett, Austen creates a vivid demonstration of the painful price of a father's failure to take responsibility in the upbringing of his daughters, especially reprehensible in a world where, as Penny pointed out, women's well-being was so dependent on the men in their lives. I'd like to finish with what Austen says about Mr. Bennett in her conclusion to Pride and Prejudice. She writes, he delighted in going to Pemberley, especially when he was least expected. Even after all that has happened, Mr. Bennett is still enjoying himself at others' expense. He ends the novel as he began it, selfishly amusing himself by discomforting his family. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Charles. That was absolutely wonderful. It was, it was just perfect. And what an almost total delinquent Mr Bennett is, I think we all agree. <laughs> so we'll now turn to a very different father. Mr. Woodhouse, Emma's father. And today we're going to have Sibylla Burkhardt to speak to us about this. Sibylla has been a JASA member since 1996. She's our JASA librarian and works as a school librarian and is an avid reader of literature and history. So let's now look at Mr. Woodhouse. Thank you, Sibylla. Um, Jane's introduction to Mr. Woodhouse, Emma's father, is not particularly promising. A man, Austin tells us, older than his years, without activity of mind and body, and whose talents could not have recommended him at any time. We quickly see that her father is no companion for her. Ronald Blythe, the editor of the 1966 Penguin edition, points out in his introduction to the novel that it is curious that so many readers think of Mr Woodhouse as an old pet, perhaps a little eccentric, whereas in fact he is a menace due to his staggering selfishness. Jane Austen describes Mr Woodhouse as a valetudinarian, meaning someone who actually has poor health rather than one who fancies himself ill. She tells us that he is a nervous man, one easily depressed whose spirits require support. He is someone who hates change. His own doctor, Mr Perry, might perhaps have followed the opinions of a Dr Hill, who wrote in 1750 that gentlemen hoping to live a long, healthy life should avoid cold and damp, go out for exercise on dry ground in the middle of the day, keep to a light diet, avoid change, especially sudden change, breathe pure, sweet air, avoid all violent emotions, even joy can be unhealthy. All of which accounts for Mr Woodhouse's addiction to gruel, his regular walks in the shrubbery on sunny days, 
his allergy to happy changes, such as people getting married, and his anxiety about his daughter and grandchildren living in the putrefying stenches of London. It also accounts for the fact that the people close to Mr. Woodhouse take his condition seriously. Emma, for example, might try to help their guests to a little more of the light meal served at Hartfield, but she does not do the same for her father. Mr. Perry's frequent visits were probably the best treatment he could give his patient, social visiting and cheerfulness being recommended by other contemporary doctors, with the caveat that these won't always cure men of older years. Emma herself is never really able to cheer up her father completely. His selfishness can in part be explained by his valetudinarianism. Personally, I think he'd be shocked if he knew that I think him selfish. His selfishness is not a tool he consciously uses. It is what makes him firmly believe that everyone else shares his ailments. To examine Mr. Woodhouse's performance as a father, we might begin with the Duckfield criteria, which Penny Dash mentioned earlier. Has Mr. Woodhouse ensured that Emma is financially secure? Here, he performs quite well. Hartfield, which we are told is a sort of notch in the Donwell Abbey estate, was originally bought for the younger branch of a very ancient family some generations ago, and is not, so far as we know, entailed. Furthermore, Mr. Woodhouse married well, as his two daughters share £60,000, which is most likely to have been brought into the marriage by their mother. Emma's 30000 would be invested, giving her an excellent annual return. Mr. Woodhouse has at least had the sense not to squander his inherited wealth, although he seems to be incapable of running his own affairs. Luckily, Mr. Knightley does this for him. On the other hand, Emma is a considerable heiress, and her father doesn't appear to be expending any thought whatsoever on possible husbands. He is very lucky that she doesn't elope with a fortune hunter, as she might well have done in an inferior novel. Turning to the second standard, the provision of educational opportunity, here too, the answer is not a resounding yes, nor entirely a no. Mr. Woodhouse chose a woman of excellent character to be Emma's governess, but neither he nor Miss Taylor were able to make Emma apply herself. Indeed, her father's uncritical praise of Emma's accomplishments is very unlikely to have made her want to try harder. And note the difference of tone between two parents. Mr. Woodhouse and Lady Catherine de Bourg, the one blinded by affection, the other driven by pride. Emma might not be a highly accomplished young woman, but at least she feels loved. As she tells Harriet, never, never could I expect to be so truly beloved and important, so always first and always right in any man's eyes as I am in my father's. And whatever le her level of accomplishment might be, Emma is fully educated in all the business of managing a home. What of the third standard, the provision and guidance of moral principles? Does his overindulgence of his daughter make Mr. Woodhouse neglect her moral education? Austin never excuses his overindulgence of Emma, but she does show him occasionally trying to correct her. As, for example, he can be seen as mildly telling her off for trying to manipulate the vicar when he advises her that it would be better to invite Mr. Elton to dinner than to find him a wife. His rebukes might be ineffectual, but they are there. Emma is not unaware of this almost concealed paternal role modeling. She says of her father that he is so generally beloved because of his tender heart and admits it is something that she does not have. The reader sees it when Mr. Woodhouse talks with sincere feeling about the poverty endured by Mrs. and Miss Bates and his wish to do more for them battles with his equally genuine wish to spare them the dangers of too much roast pork. Emma tends to look down on the Bates ladies. Her father sees them as members of his community who deserve consideration. Emma has enough principle to keep herself in check with one notable exception. Generally, she's well-regulated. Emma, we are told during one conversation, 
denied none of it aloud and agreed to none of it in private. Austin tells us that the real evils indeed of Emma's situation were the power of having rather too much of her own way and a disposition to think a little too well of herself. And to a large extent, Mr. Woodhouse is the cause and enabler of these evils. So I think we can give Mr. Woodhouse only qualified passes on the three standards where he fa fails completely is in providing emotional support. The book opens with an instance of this failure. Emma is forlorn because she's just lost the daily company of her friend and her father, instead of trying to cheer her up, first settles down to a nap, then requires her to talk to him, uh, talk him out of his desolation at seeing Miss Taylor become such a happy bride. Generally, he cares much more about Emma's physical well-being than about her feelings. His anxieties limit Emma's freedom. She has never seen the sea. She has never visited her sister in London, as far as we know. The thing he worries about I uh, include, but are not limited to, a holiday by the sea, because he's convinced it once almost killed him, a ball at the Crown Inn, because rooms in inns are always damp and dangerous, Mr Elton travelling to Bath, because he might never get safely to the end of the journey, a solitary drive from Vicarage Lane. Solitary diving does turn out to be dangerous for Emma, but not for the reasons that make her father tremble until her safe arrival in Hartfield. Plus he worries about open windows, open doors, eggs not boiled by silver cook, roast pork, apples not baked long enough, and don't ever sit outdoors. His response to the cancellation of the proposed ball at the Crown Inn, everyone would be safer at home, is typical. But just as the reader is ready to give up on him, out comes a glimpse of his more empathetic side. It was shocking to have dear Emma disappointed. Austin doesn't explain Mr Woodhouse's anxieties, although as he seems to equate marriage with loss, it is likely that some of them stem from the untimely death of his wife. Perhaps it's just the way he is. After all, Isabella is a good picture of what he might once have been like as the father of a young family, devoted and anxious. And perhaps we should also remember that his fears are not completely irrational. Jane Fairfax does almost drown at the seaside and Mrs Churchill does very suddenly die. We might sometimes wonder how such a clever and lively girl could be the daughter of such a father but Emma does share some of his traits. They are both fanciful. When Emma attributes this to herself, Mr Woodhouse mistakenly thinks she's talking about him, and they're both capable of bending reality to suit their pre and misconceptions. He talks of poor Miss Taylor, while the reader is shown a happy Mrs Weston, and Emma misconstrues Mr Elton's attentions towards her as being directed at Harriet. One of Mr Woodhouse's biggest conceptions is his firm belief that Emma is like him. He's constantly telling people that late nights don't agree with Emma, that she will get very tired. His concern must to some extent lessen her ability to enjoy herself while she is out. His inability to enter in on Emma's feelings, let alone comprehend them, means that her situation is very restricted. She recognises this when she's musing about Harriet after Mr Elton's unwelcome proposal. Their being fixed, so absolutely fixed in the same place, was bad for each, for all three. Her restricted social life can be laid at her father's door. And this, in spite of the fact that, as Austin tells us, the Woodhouses have many acquaintances, for Mr Woodhouse was universally civil, but he only enjoys the company of those who visit him on his own terms, and those terms do not include late hours or large dinner parties and definitely not dancing. Emma is happy to be able to arrange little parties for him with his particular friends, but cannot pretend to herself that she enjoys listening to the quiet prosings of three such women as Mrs and Miss Bates and Mrs Goddard. Loneliness and intellectual solitude are the best descriptors of Emma's situation, yet throughout the novel it is Emma who supports her father's fragile emotional state. I don't think that he ever shows equal sympathy towards her. <laughs>
Jemima, however, with her happy disposition, doesn't expect our compassion. Indeed, we are shown that how she very cleverly manages her father to suit her own wishes when necessary, and Austin uses him to support her plot. Mr. Woodhouse is used to scatter the clues which make Emma something of a detective story. It is he, for example, who remembers such obscure details as the date and place of Frank's first letter to Mrs. Weston, which tells the reader that Frank was in Weymouth at the same time as Jane Fairfax. Another clue is Mr. Knightley's unfailingly considerate behaviour towards Mr. Woodhouse, which shows the attentive reader that here is the only worthy applicant for the position of son-in-law, as opposed to Frank Churchill, who, as Mr. Woodhouse rightly observes, if for the wrong reasons, is not quite the thing. Mr. Woodhouse is an, an example of the literary trope of retired, impotent father figure who tries to immobilize his daughter, but Austin humanizes him by careful revelation often through the thoughts and actions of more major characters and carefully develops his role in her novel. In the first part of the novel, he's shown as trying to confine Emma both physically inside Hartfield by his insistence on the dangers lurking beyond its shrubberies and metaphorically through his inability to find fault in her, thus hindering her on her journey to self-knowledge. In the central part of the novel, Emma is shown as doing what she wants in spite of his unchanged attitudes. Essentially, she defies him. She does go to the Colts party and to the ball at the Crown. And although her father's opinions on going out to parties don't change, Emma goes on going out to Donwell and Box Hill. She's beginning to physically escape. And in the final part of the novel, when she has developed greater self-knowledge, Emma exploits his attitudes to get her own way. She plays on his fear of being robbed by the poultry thieves to get his consent to her marriage with Mr. Knightley, albeit based on the sacrifice of Mr. Knightley's independence at Donwell. Mrs. Elton predicts that such a sacrifice will result in separation, but the reader probably doesn't share her attitude because by this stage, we understand the dynamics of the Woodhouse family. Many of us even like Mr. Woodhouse in spite of his doing so much to blight his, father, his daughter's life. Why? Why do we like him? Why are his neighbours willing to humour him, sending to inquire after him, for example, after the attack on Harriet by the gypsies, because they knew that he loved to be inquired after? Why is Mr. Knightley ready to give up his independence? Mr. Woodhouse's good qualities are often hidden, but they are there. So although we might condemn him for trying to deprive his guests of the excellent dinner Emma has provided, we also recognize that he is prompted by a genuine concern for their health. He is sincere when he regrets that the nasty turn into Vicarage Lane prevents him from visiting the new bride, as he well knows is her due. And Mrs. Elton, although completely misinterpreting him, quite rightly points out his old fashioned politeness and gallantry. Furthermore, Austin shows us that he is considerate of his servants, even if this is also self-serving. James will not like to have to harness the horses for so short a journey as between Hartfield and Randalls, and this very fortuitous consideration will serve Mr. Woodhouse, save Mr. Woodhouse from having to venture beyond the gates of Hartfield. He is pleased that he could find a good place for one of the maids. The fact that he has observed how she doesn't bang doors is of course due to his nerves, but it also shows that he is appreciative of the effort others make for him. His genuine courtesy and his tender heart make it difficult to completely dislike him, even if it is impossible to overlook his selfishness. Mr. Woodhouse then is as carefully nuanced a figure as any in Austen's novels. He is a problematic father, a menace even, yet he has plenty of redeeming qualities. Emma's own love for him is as unconditional as his is for her. Perhaps his most significant job in the plot is that the reader can measure the success of Emma's journey towards self-knowledge against his selfishness. Facing the prospect of a Mrs. Harriet Knightley and the inevitable result of a lifetime of backgammon with her father, we recognize as readers 
the fortitude with which Emma gives Mr Knightley the opening to confide in her. Because we know Mr Woodhouse, we recognise this as an act of selfless heroism. Her father has done everything to restrict the life of his lively daughter, and she has never complained. She manages him in such a way that he never realises that he is really in her power as mistress of the house. Everything is done for his comfort and the way he likes it. And when he doesn't like it, because in spite of his objections, Emma will have a round table and she will go to the coals and to the ball, she does it in a way that makes it as easy as possible for him to accept her defiance of his wishes. As she herself says, no one could ever accuse her of being unfeeling towards her father. So, taken all together, the reader's relationship with Mr Woodhouse is complicated, but perhaps on the whole favourable. He is, after all, I believe, the only Austen father who made it to a postage stamp. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Sibylla. That was an excellent analysis and so well balanced. And so we do see all sides there and some very redeeming features. Oh. We'll now turn to Anne Elliott's father in Persuasion and Michelle Kavanagh will talk to us about Sir Walter Elliott. So Michelle Kavanagh is a writer, historian and researcher, a graduate of Macquarie University who has maintained a lifelong love of theatre, Australian history and literature. She is the Vice President of the Australian Bronte Association, an active member of JAZZA, the New South Wales Dickens Society and other literary societies. Among her other interests, Michelle is also a committee member of the Parramatta branch of the National Trust. So now let's hear about Sir Walter Elliott from Persuasion. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, thank you, Julie. Pomposity and parenthood do not make a good mix, but doubtless Sir Walter Elliot of Kellynich Hall in Somersetshire was as pompous as they come. Arrogant and conceited, Sir Walter was vain about two things, his appearance and his title, which were seen as blessings and gifts, both given to him by his parents, rather than rewards for his own hard work. Sir Walter's wife, Elizabeth Lee Stephen, bought a large sum of money to the marriage, £30,000, which generated about £1,200 per year, negating the necessity for her husband's frugality. Sixteen years after the death of his wife, with whom he sired three daughters, Elizabeth, Anne and Mary, as well as a stillborn son, there was no one to curb Sir Walter's habit of lavish spending and his strong desire to maintain appearances which now threatened the very future of the Elliot family. His favourite daughter, Elizabeth, who ran the estate since the death of her mother, shared her father's lack of financial sense. Finally, accepting the necessity of renting out Kellynich Hall, while he himself rented a townhouse in Camden Place, a fashionable part of Bath, Sir Walter was more concerned with the physical beauty of the Kellynich renters, Admiral and Mrs Croft, as well as their manners and breeding. Sir Walter had a different set of values to both his daughter Anne and Captain Wentworth, who Anne eventually married. As a vain, pretentious, stubborn and self-absorbed baronet, Sir Walter is comically ridiculous, a caricature of the old titled class, allowing Austen to poke fun at the declining aristocracy. With the rise of industry in Great Britain beginning in the late 18th century, old title families were forced to consider accepting the nouveau riche into their circle. Such industrial magnates and wealthy merchants who had made their fortunes trading with the colonies had large amounts of money, 
and could afford to challenge the importance of birth in social interactions. Sir Walter's strong attachment to the significant of birth appears antiquated in the new century of progress. While he is perfectly capable of selling off a small section of his land, his pride causes him to insist on pa passing Kellynich Hall intact to his heir, his cousin William Elliot, in the same state as he himself inherited it. While this pride is certainly to William N. Elliot's benefit, it is not so beneficial for his daughters. At Kelly Nitch Hall, with a dressing room surrounded by mirrors, a baronetage book treasured for its description of the Elliot family, and a desire to be seen only with attractive and socially important people, Sir Walter is the very image of conceit. Yet Sir Walter's ridiculousness highlights the fact that his kind are no longer the preferred version of manliness. In stark contrast is the gallant, brave naval officer, Captain Wentworth, a very different and more modern ideal of the British gentleman. That Anne had her own mind is clear from the way she rebels against the vanity of her father and elder sister. But Anne is not one to avoid her responsibility and duty as a member of the upper class. She understands and respects the importance of making a suitable match and is offended, and is offended by the prospect of someone as low as Mrs Clay entering into her family through marriage to her father, which appears to be a possibility. Anne is conscious of the social structure in which her relations operate, and though she may seek a bit more flexibility, she by no means wishes to seriously challenge notions of class. Anne Elliot, the principal actor in the drama of the novel Persuasion, is like most Austen heroes, witty, clever and considerate. Austen referred to her in one of her letters as a heroine who is almost too good for me. Though Austin very frankly notes that the bloom of youth has left Anne, that she is not the prettiest of the young ladies in the novel, Anne becomes more attractive when her better qualities are noticed. Unlike her father, Anne takes pride in practicality, intellect and patience. Anne Elliot is feminine while possessing none of what Austin clearly sees as the negative characters of her gender. She is neither catty, flighty, nor hysterical. On the contrary, she is level-headed in dif difficult situations and constant in her affections. Such qualities make her the desirable woman to marry. She is the first choice of Charles M Mosgrove, who, when Anne refuses him, marries her younger sister, Mary. Anne is then wooed by her cousin, William Elliot, heir to Kellynich Hall, a smooth talker who everyone agrees is perfectly what he ought to be. Only six months after the death of his first wife and at the end of a marriage that was generally known to be unhappy, he is searching for a new bride, having Anne in his sights to take on the role which is thwarted by Anne's friend, Mrs. Smith, when she explains to Anne how greed saw William Ellis hide most of her friend's fortune to which she was entitled. Having been in love with Captain Wentworth since she was 19 years old and dissuaded from this match by Lady Russell, an intimate friend of her late mother and Anne's godmother, of whom she is particularly fond. Lady Russell, who values social rank and finds in Anne the Elliot daughter, who is mo most like her late friend, is instrumental in Sir Walter's decision to leave Kellynich Hall to avoid financial crisis. It was Lady Russell who persuaded young Anne not to marry Wentworth seven years earlier on account of his lack of wealth. In the end, 
Anne concludes that she was right at 19 years of age to have been persuaded by Lady Russell not to marry Captain Wentworth. With her respect for duty and with an independent mind, Anne balances passion and practicality. Je a Canadian scholar and author, Sheila Johnson Kindred, states that part of persuasion were inspired by the career of Anne's brother, Charles Austin, a Royal Naval officer, as there are some similarities between the career of the real life Captain Austin and the fictional Captain Wentworth. Both began their careers in command of sloops in the North American station at about the same age. Both were popular with their crews. Both progressed to the command of frigates. Both were keen to share their prize money with their crews, though Captain Wentworth ended up considerably richer as a result of his prize money than did Captain Austin. Likewise, Captain Austin's wife, Fanny, whom he married in Bermuda in 1807, bears some similarity to Mrs. Croft, who, like Fanny Austin, lived aboard naval vessels for a time, living alternatively in Bermuda and Halifax, the two ports that hosted the Royal Navy's North American station, and crossed the Atlantic five times. Though Mrs. Croft was middle-aged in the novel, Fanny Austin was only 15 years old when she married Captain Austin. Despite the fact that family values are important to Anne, I believe that her good sense means that she is not too negatively affected by her father, Sir Walter Elliot's behaviour. My thoughts are reiterated by a, a blog written by Sheila Kindred in which she states that she, and I quote here, became fascinated with the supple, subtle intricacies of Anne's self-examination of her own disappointment and her effects to be open to the needs of others, even in the face of her own unhappiness. I was caught up in the suspense of the plot as Austin describes Anne's initially fragile but increasingly strengthen, strengthening hope that she may find happiness with Captain Wentworth. I admired and continue to admire Austin's remarkable ability to capture her character's personalities their ways of, and their ways of speaking. This is also a book with a special place in my life in times of trouble, of worry or in certain uncertainty, it absorbs, it distracts and comfort, comforts me, end quote. Once the decision had been made by Anne and Captain Wentworth to, to marry, Anne tells Wentworth, I have been thinking over the past and trying impartially to judge of the right and wrong, I mean with regard to myself, and I must believe that I was right much as I suffered from it, that I was perfectly right to be guided by the friend who you will love better than you do now. To me, that was she was at the place of a parent, and here she's talking about Lady Russell. When, after hearing that Louisa and Captain Benwick were engaged, and Captain Wentworth professed his undying love for Anne, my heart leapt. On hearing the news of the young lover's decision to marry, Sir Walter made no objection. And I quote, Captain Wentworth, with five and twenty thousand pounds, and as high in his profession as merit and activity could place him, was no longer a nobody. He was now esteemed quite worthy to address the daughter of a foolish spendthrift baronet who had not the principle or sense enough to maintain himself in the situation in which Providence had placed him and who could give his daughter at present but a small part of the share of 10,000 pounds, which must be hers hereafter, end quote. Once Sir Walter saw more of Captain Wentworth, he was very much struck by his personal claims, feeling that his superiority of an appearance and superiority of a rank, assisted by his well-sounding name, 
saw Sir Walter at last to prepare his pen with very good grace for the insertion of the marriage in the volume of honour, which was esteemed to be so important to him. To finish with the last sentence of the novel, Anne gloried in being a sailor's wife, but she must pay the tax of quick alarm for belonging to that profession which is, if possible, more distinguished in its domestic virtues than it's in its na national importance. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Yes, that quote you uh, you mentioned about the spendthrift foolish Sir Walter. I think that that quote really sums up how Jane Austen felt about it. We're going to hear about General Tilney now. So Judy is a very active jazz member, a writer and researcher whose research interests include Jane Austen's life, works and circle, plus the romantic receptions of classical texts and women writers of the 18th century. Her books include Jane Austen's inspiration, beloved friend Anne Lefroy, and The Missing Monument Murders, about crime and fraud revealed in Jane Austen's family at Stonely Abbey. So let's hear from, from Judy Stove. Neither as a gentleman nor as a parent, General Tilney as a how-not-to father. There's a theme in Northanger Abbey around parenting. It's not overt, it's not explicit, but it's there deeply embedded in the structure of the work. And Austen shows us four different models of parenting. The Morlands, the Allens, Mrs Thorpe and General Tilney. Now, when I started working on this, I, I, it occurred to me that part of the background to Austen's famously deficient fathers might have been that the nation itself was to an extent fatherless. Uh, Austen had, of course, begun to, to draft the work long before the Regency, but King George III had in practice been a non-functioning father of his country for many years, at least 20 years by the time she came to redraft the work. And as for the Prince Regent, well, he was hardly a fa father figure either. He was more a persistently Peter Pan kind of figure. And so I thought, well, other people must have examined this theme, but I, I couldn't find very much. I did find this article by Stuart Semmel, Radicals, Loyalists and the Royal Jubilee of 1809. And he wrote in passing, in historical retrospect, the King's Jubilee of 1809 cannot but seem a poignant final blow for an elderly monarch who, as events transpired, would very soon retire into the shades of mental illness and his son's regency. So if we look at our very first parenting model, it's the Morlands. On Catherine's preparing to leave for Bath with the Allens, we read, everything indeed relative to this important journey was done on the part of the Morlands, with a degree of moderation and composure, which seemed rather consistent with the common feelings of common life than with the refined susceptibilities, the tender emotions, which the first separation of a heroine from her family ought always to excite. Her father, instead of giving her an unlimited order on his banker, or even putting an hundred pounds bank bill into her hands, gave her only 10 guineas and promised her more when she wanted it. Only 10 guineas? This was actually half a year's wages for a working man at the time. And so it was a very generous provision, bearing in mind that it's basically pocket money for Catherine. The, the main costs of the journey and accommodation will of course be borne by the Allens. And if we think later on to when Catherine's on the point of leaving Northanger Abbey and Eleanor checks whether she has any money. She hasn't. She's spent it all. So Catherine may not have been provisioned like an heroine, but she could certainly spend like one. Then there are the Allens. Now, they don't have any children of their own, but they are in loco parentis for Catherine. Results are mixed, as are the messages. Mrs Allen is relaxed about letting Catherine go out in an open carriage with the Thorpes. But Mr. Allen is not. Young men and women driving about the country in open carriages, now and then it is very well, but going to inns and public places together, it is not right. And then Mrs. Allen changes her mind. Yes, my dear, a very odd appearance indeed. I cannot bear to see it. Dear madam, cried Catherine, then why did you not tell me so before? 
Then we have Mrs. Thorpe, and she turns out not to be a good judge either. We see that Mr. Allen's expressed doubts about Mrs. Thorpe's parenting. And then there's the silly secrecy about Isabella Thorpe's engagement with James Morland. Mrs. Thorpe and her son, who were acquainted with everything, were allowed to join the girls' councils and add their quota of significant looks and mysterious expressions to fill up the measure of curiosity to be raised in the unprivileged younger Thorpe sisters. To Catherine's simple feelings, this odd sort of reserve seemed neither kindly meant nor consistently supported. And finally, our last parent is General Tilney. Now, at first, he seems the model of civility and kindness to Catherine. He's very flattering. Catherine is most politely received at Milsom Street. But in spite of General Tilney's great civilities to her, in spite of his thanks, invitations and compliments, it had been a release to get away from him. Catherine is perplexed by this. How can it be a relief to be out of the General's presence when he seems so well disposed towards her? In the meantime, the Morlands demonstrate their practical kindness as parents. As Catherine had said to Isabella, it's impossible for parents to be more kind or more desirous of their children's happiness. A living of which Mr. Morland was himself patron and incumbent about, of about 400 pounds yearly value was to be resigned to his son as soon as he should be old enough to take it. No trifling deduction from the family income, no niggardly assignment to one of 10 children. An estate of at least equal value, moreover, was assured as his future inheritance. Now we know from Brenda Cox's work that the Reverend George Austin, Jane's father, earned about 900 pounds a year for his two livings. So this shows how generous the Morland's provision is. But the Thorpes don't see it that way. Mrs. Thorpe says, Mr. Morland has behaved so very handsome, you know. I always heard he was a most excellent man. And you know, my dear, we're not to suppose, but what if you had had a suitable fortune, he would have come down with something more, for I'm sure he must be a most liberal-minded man. For her part, Isabella adds, nobody can think better of Mr. Morland than I do, I'm sure. But everybody has their failing, you know, and everybody has a right to do what they like with their own money. So Mrs. Thorpe is shown to be as poor and mean-spirited a judge as her daughter, which is saying something. Back to General Tilney and the journey to Northanger Abbey. Catherine notices that he seemed always a check upon his children's spirits. He was angry and impatient with the waiters at the roadside inns, so that Catherine came to dread disobliging the general by any delay. Austin shows us uh, the general's way of interacting with Catherine. His, uh, she shows it through indirect discourse, among other things. He was enchanted by her approbation of his taste, confessed the table setting to be neat and simple, thought it right to encourage the manufacture of his country. So it's as if he's saying this old thing, but getting brownie points for supporting local industry as well. He turned away and Catherine was shocked to find how much her spirits were relieved by the separation. Yet again, Catherine can't quite understand why she is relieved when he leaves them alone. Now, when Catherine learns from Henry Tilney how foolish and, uh, and very unreasonable her imaginings about Mrs Tilney had been, she's quite overcome with embarrassment. But at the same time, she realised she was right in her aversion to the general. Catherine's intuitions are sometimes very sound and she's inherited principles as well as sound judgment from her parents. So after reflecting on the whole thing, upon this conviction, she need not fear to acknowledge some actual specks in the character of their father, who though cleared from the grossly injurious suspicions which she must ever blush to have entertained, she did believe, upon serious consideration, to be not perfectly amiable. So she'd been right about him, but for the wrong reasons. And of course, the general goes on to confirm this in dispatching her so rudely, using Eleanor as a proxy from the Abbey. The manner in which it was done, so grossly uncivil, hurrying her away without any reference to her own convenience, or allowing her even the appearance of choice as to the time or mode of her travelling, at almost the earliest hour, as if resolved to have her gone before he was stirring in the morning, that he might not be obliged even to see her. What could all this mean but an intentional affront? <laughs>
And so Eleanor steps up. She is now in loco parentis. In checking whether Catherine has any money for the journey and supplying it as a loan, Eleanor acts as the parent where the general has failed. And in fact, money turns out to be key to Catherine's successful journey home. Her youth, civil manners and liberal pay procured her all the attention that a traveller like herself could require. And stopping only to change horses, she travelled on for about 11 hours without accident or alarm and between 6 and 7 o'clock in the evening found herself entering Fullerton. Mr and Mrs Morland could not but feel that the journey might have been productive of much unpleasantness to Catherine, that it was what they could never have voluntarily suffered, and that in forcing her on such a measure, General Tilney had acted neither honourably or feelingly, neither as a gentleman nor as a parent. Why he had done it did not, did not oppress them by any means so long, and after a due course of useless conjecture that it was a strange business and that he must be a very strange man, grew enough for all their indignation and wonder. My dear Sarah, you give yourself a great deal of needless trouble, said her mother at last. Depend upon it, it is something not at all worth understanding. The wisdom of Mrs Morland, the motives of others are always more or less opaque to us. When Henry arrives at Fullerton, he did not address himself to an uncandid judge or a resentful heart. Far from comprehending him or his sister in their father's misconduct, Mrs Morland had always been kindly disposed towards each, and instantly, pleased by his appearance, received him with the simple professions of unaffected benevolence, thanking him for such an attention to her daughter, assuring him that the friends of her children were always welcome there, and entreating him to say not another word of the past. Having wondered and corrected Catherine's mistakes about his father, Henry is now in the uncomfortable position of having to admit that the general has in fact behaved cruelly and unnaturally. The Morlands' tempers were mild, but their principles were steady, and while his parents so expressly forbade the connection, they could not allow themselves to encourage it. But whenever Catherine received a letter, as at that time happened pretty often, they always looked another way. And finally, it is Eleanor's elevation to a title which finally softens the general enough for him to give an offhand permission for Henry to marry. And as this took place within a 12 month after the first day of their meeting, it will not appear, after all the dreadful delays occasioned by the general's cruelty, that they were essentially hurt by it. I leave it to be settled by whomsoever it may concern whether the tendency of this work be altogether to recommend parental tyranny or reward filial disobedience. So thus, at the end, Austin has a final laugh at our expense, underlining my contention that parenting is one of the key themes of the book. The Morlands are perhaps the most likeable and admirable parents in Austin's works. Their goodness and their sense more than common are highlighted by the contrast with the very bad parent that is General Tilney. Thank you. Okay, we'll now move on to Sir Thomas Bertram from Mansfield Park, who, who is a sort of father of, of the Bertram children, but he's also uh, takes on that foster role of, of, of Fanny as well. So with Jan Merriman is from the Southern Highlands Jazza Group, and she co coordinates that group and has presented papers to conferences and various groups on Jane Austen related themes. Jan's a retired teacher of English literature and language, an academic, an actor, a graduate of Sydney and Macquarie Universities. So Jan has written a book on Jane Austen's aunt, Philadelphia Hancock, which will be published in October. So stay tuned in about that. So I'll now hand over to Jan Merriman. Thank you. Well, good morning and thank you very much for the opportunity to present this paper to our study day on fathers in Jane Austen from my home on the sunny south coast. As a matter of fact, it's a rich topic. And uh, as said, my talks on Sir Thomas Bertram of Mansfield Park, the title of both novel and house and perhaps a trifle confusingly so for a presenter. Sir Thomas is not the only hereditary baronet who features in Jane Austen's works. We've already heard of one of them today, Sir Walter Elliot in Persuasion. These baronets, I think they all carry their titles with a sense of considerable self-importance. 
while Sir Walter, in his absurdity as Austen's comic creation of grotesque vanity, is really to be enjoyed, Sir Thomas's status is carried much more heavily. Mansfield Park, while it has its share of delicious irony, mainly at the expense of um, Mrs Norris, uh, for example, regarding the stolen green baize drapes and Lady Bertram and her pugs, is actually a quite serious work. Sir Thomas is very rarely satirised in the text, and while we're often allowed into the mind and mental processes of Sir Thomas as he thinks through or rationalises the views he holds and decisions he makes, overall he's taken very seriously. He himself is shown to take himself, his title, duties and responsibilities very seriously indeed. Sir Thomas is far from a joke. Two recurrent words in the novel concerning Sir Thomas are dignity and gravity. These could be seen as attributes, but they're also character flaws. His very presence casts a pall of oppression over his children. He's a complex character. He both cares for his children, takes his fatherly responsibilities very seriously, as I suggested, but he fails them. Most importantly, he never really knows his children. Austen says in the final chapter that he had allowed his children, quote, to repress their spirits in his presence as to make their real dispositions unknown to him. They find it difficult to even speak when in his presence. In my part of the discussion of fathers today, I'll talk about how Austen creates in Sir Thomas a father who is unwittingly almost a terrifying monster to his own children, Tom, Edmund, Maria and Julia, and his surrogate daughter, our novel's heroine, Fanny Price, and comes close to destroying the lives of them all. I'll do this by examining pivotal episodes in the novel that demonstrate Sir Thomas's strengths and weaknesses as a father and in his interactions with his four children and his niece, Fanny. The author herself knew quite a few baronets and there were baronets in her family. Her father's mother, Rebecca Hampson, was the daughter of Sir George Hampson Bart, holder of the Taplow Buckinghamshire Baronetcy. Like the family of her own Freeman cousins and the fictionalised Bertram family of Mansfield Park, the Hampson family were slave owners with extensive sugar plantations in Jamaica. Mansfield Park was written in its entirety by the mature Jane Austen in 1813. Now she was an established published author of two well-received novels. It's sophisticated, strongly imagined, and superbly constructed, fusing the intimate family world of Mansfield Park, the house, with the shifting moral complexities, complexities of a changing wider world. Hints of that shifting world come in the allusions to Sir Thomas's slave plantations in Antigua, the Crawford's Guardian, which brings in Allah, the court of the Prince Regent, the dissolute admiral of the fleet, of a country that was still at war, the debauched lifestyle of the city, and the profligate eldest son, Tom Bertram, and his country house cronies. She creates in the character of Sir Thomas a strong sense of his own dignity, and indeed, he seeks to maintain that dignity to the extent that he is alienated from his children's affections. And yet, while his children are afraid of him, intimidated by him, contradictorily, he doesn't wish to be a harsh, harsh father. As I said, he's a complex character, full of ambiguities, as he struggles with his dignity and his authority. Early in the novel, he seems to give in too easily to Mrs Norris and allowing her to override him by offering little resistance to her belief that Fanny must continue to live in Man at Mansfield Park and not with her. And yet he later stands up to his sister-in-law, insisting that Fanny have the carriage to take her to the evening party at the Grants, rather than concede to Mrs Norris' insistence that Fanny walk. 
I quote, Fanny thought it perfectly reasonable that she should walk. And when Sir Thomas soon afterwards, just opening the door said, Fanny, what time would you have the carriage come round? Or well, she felt a degree of astonishment, which made it impossible for her to speak. My dear Sir Thomas, cried Mrs Norris, red with anger, Fanny can walk. Walk, repeated Sir Thomas, in a tone of most unanswerable dignity. And coming farther into the room, my niece walked to a dinner engagement at this time of the year? Will 20 minutes after four suit you? Fanny felt that her uncle's consideration of her, coming of her coming immediately after such representations from her aunt cost her some tears of gratitude when she was alone. Sir Thomas's dignity, that word again, provides all the authority to enforce Mrs Norris to back down. Yet his argument as to why Fanny should have the carriage seems more about what is appropriate in relation to his dignity, i.e. my niece walked to a dinner engagement. But then Fanny is deeply moved by what appears to her as her uncle's tender consideration for her. It's Austen's understanding of both the contemporary social mores and the subtleties of the human heart that allow both interpretations of Sir Thomas to be at play in this incident. He's also excessively compliant with the indolence of his wife, who seems to offer him the most trifling of support as a wife and mother of his children. She abandons him in London, and her children appear to be well below her pug in her interest and affections. Despite his sense of his own dignity, he did not marry wisely, for he was, to use the author's own words, captivated by Miss Mariah Ward, whatever that might mean. I think we know. But he is described as being generous to his wife's family and of combining a sense of principle of doing the right thing with a strong notion of his own social position, of pride and respectability. And now I move on to his children, the first, the eldest son, Tom Bertram. We never really get close to Tom Bertram. He's almost a caricature of the squandering, dissolute eldest son and heir entitled, narcissistic, and keeps bad company. At the time of the opening of the novel already, quote, his eldest son was careless and extravagant and had given his father, quote, much uneasiness. It is a given already that Tom Bertram has none of his father's dignity and that Sir Thomas seems powerless to doing anything much about that, even when Tom's extravagance has been so great as to force his father into selling the Mansfield Park parsonage living and deny it to his younger son, son brother Edmund, who ought rightfully inherit it. He tells his son that he blushes for him, saying it in his most dignified manner. Tom's reaction to his father's admonishment is to briefly feel, quote, some shame and some sorrow and escape from his father's presence as quickly as possible. When Sir Thomas decides he has to go in person to his Antiguan estates, he takes Tom with him in the hope of detaching him from bad connections at home. He is concerned about his son, and when Tom is gravely ill after their return, Sir Thomas grieves from his son and is able to show his love. But the pair are completely emotionally and socially estranged from each other until Tom seems to recover from that grave illness and have something of a change in his personality. But for most of the novel, it appears Tom has been allowed by his father to live a dissolute lifestyle, one that almost kills him. Next, Edmund. Edmund has all the characteristics of the younger son. He has none of the entitlement. His father is happy with him, and Edmund, we know, is kind to Fanny, infatuated with Mary Crawford, but I suggest fairly ineffectual. While Sir Thomas recognises Edmund as having, quote, 
strong good sense and uprightness of mind. Like everyone else, Edmund is frightened of his father. When Sir Thomas unexpectedly returns from the West Indies to find his home full of strangers, his private accommodations taken over and rearranged and money spent on paper, painters and carpenters building stage sets, he's perfectly entitled to feel outrage. Most of them scatter, except Mr Yates, whom Sir Thomas quickly picks as an idiot. His own children are mortified and find it hard to speak or say anything. However, Edmund at least is prepared to face his father, to tell him what has been going on to some degree, while Tom Bertram just tries to keep up some kind of banter. In Sir Thomas's absence, the house has become alive. The young people have an enormous sense of liberty and release with him gone. It doesn't lead to very good outcomes, but the father's oppressive presence is a blight on their lives. Edmund is keenly aware that his father would not approve, but he can't resist the siren call of that liberty and the presence of Mary Crawford. He is put in financial peril by the extravagance of his brother which Sir Thomas, as I said, seems powerless to prevent. And he might have married Mary Crawford, whom he describes later as, quote, a woman of blunted delicacy and a corrupted, vitiated mind. Would he have been happy? At the end of the novel, Sir Thomas is allowed to regret his actions as a parent and indulges in many insights into his faults as a father. In a way, his fundamentally good character emerges, and none more so as when he acknowledges the love of Edmund and Feck. Quote, their own inclinations ascertained. There were no difficulties behind, no drawbacks of poverty or parent. He was, Sir Thomas, sick of ambitious and mercenary connections, prizing more and more the sterling good of principle and temper. Now to Mariah and Julia Bertram. Ah, uh, poor Mariah, one of Austen's unluckiest young women. Undeservedly so, I've always thought. Her sister Julia fares a little better. The sister's upbringing by both parents has let them down. Austen is viciously critical of both the daughter's formal education and all the inadequacies of it at boarding school, as well of their mother's neglect and of Sir Thomas's allowing Mrs Norris to so far rule the roost and spoil and flatter them, for his confidence in their being merely Bertrams would be sufficient, are all highly destructive to them both. Their father is quite superficial in his assessment in seeing them becoming, quote, in person, manner and accomplishments, everything that could satisfy his anxiety. They do all they can to avoid him. They are intimidated in his presence. While Sir Thomas on his unexpected return before he finds out about the play, bathes himself in the pleasure of having all his family around him, and Lady Bertram wallows on the sofa, oblivious of any problem, the girls are dumbstruck in his presence with disappointment and terror. It's interesting that Sir Thomas is not really deceived by what he observes of his children. He recognises that Mariah's fiancé, Mr Rushworth, who is the richest man in Jane Austen's fiction, is a fool, and that his daughter does not even like him, let alone love him. Yet, he does allow her to marry him. In the episode where he gently tries to tease out the truth about Mariah's feelings about going ahead with the wedding and offers her every opportunity to escape it, there's no sense that Mariah can ever reveal the truth to him of Henry Crawford and of how she really feels. There is no trust between them. The gap is impossible to breach, and Mariah herself, so full of anger and bitterness about Henry Crawford's treatment of her, 
that she is absolutely driven by her own self-destructive ends. A very sad fate await, awaits Mariah, banishment from her home and the rest of her life stuck with Aunt Norris. I've held out hopes, perhaps not, but I hate the thought she might have ended up on the town. And Sir Thomas regresses immediately, what a, recognises immediately what a poor specimen is Mr Yates, but does nothing to prevent the connection. Though Austin tells us in time, Julia, quote, was humble and wishing to be forgiven, and Mr Yates improved by wishing to be connected to the family and actually turned out to have more money than Sir Thomas had thought. And now to Fanny Price, his surrogate daughter. The moral compass of the novel Mansfield Park always points towards Fanny. It is something of a literary burden she has to bear. Her relationship with Sir Thomas is shifting and complex. He sees himself as her guardian, responsible for and caring and acting in her best interests. He has an understanding of what difficulties Fanny might face, taking her place in his family and with her cousins. He doesn't want her left out, yet, she's, she, yet she, in a way, also has to be aware that she will never be a Miss Bertram and all the dignity that would afford her. Ironically, of course, she does become a Mrs Bertram. She initially, and for a very long time throughout the novel, is simply terrified by him. Even though he contrasts, is contrasted to Mr Norris in her behaviour towards Fanny, Mrs Norris would give any wicked stepmother a serious run for her money, whereas Sir Thomas is, with one exception, almost always a benevolent paterfamilia to Fanny. He's also a contrast to his own, her own crude father. While they both, awkwardly for a modern reader, I suggest, admire her looks and figure as she grows up, Sir Thomas's language is more refined and seemingly benign. Sir Thomas takes his responsibility for Fanny's care very seriously right from the beginning. He receives her kindly as a 10-year-old, seeing how shy she is. So he tries, quote, to be all that was conciliating, but he had to work against a most untoward gravity of deportment. Fanny remains, quote, awed by Sir Thomas's grave looks. But over time, there are subtle movements in how he treats Fanny and how Fanny perceives him. Sir Thomas is absent for a large chunk, almost two thirds of the first volume, and finds a different Fanny, a blossoming Fanny on his return. He favours her, speaks gently to her, <clears throat> and while still terrified of him, Fanny appreciates his care. Until, of course, he tries to insist she marries Henry Crawford. Sir Thomas is as wrong in this as he is in anything else in the novel. Previously, there's been a generosity towards Fanny and her family, but not here. He only sees advantage in the match, knowing nothing of what went on with Maria, and no one can tell him. He is blind to Fanny's protest, but Fanny, of course, alone has the moral metal to stand up to him. She's banished rather cruelly, and Sir Thomas is portrayed here as a not untypical, tyrannical father. However, Fanny is redeemed by the narrative when Mariah runs off with Henry Crawford. Fanny's future has become saved, and Sir Thomas comes to value her, and she becomes, quote, indeed the daughter he wanted. A complex character is Sir Thomas, perhaps a little stereotyped as a tyrannical father, but an intriguing and ambiguous one also. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Jan. That was a really excellent analysis and really covered all those complexities. And that, that was just marvellous. And what a high note for us to finish on today. Thank you. So everyone, I hope you have enjoyed our study morning, considering these flawed and fallible fathers, complex sometimes, who in varied ways fell short of their roles as financial or moral protectors. Who do you think is the worst? Thankfully, our heroines found a way out and had their happy outcomes. I would like to thank all of our wonderful speakers, Penny, Charles, Sibylla, Michelle, Judy and Jan for their excellent presentations and their willingness to contribute. I'd also like to thank Cheryl Hill for her technical support, for doing the jigsaw for us and for making this session on Zoom possible. Thanks also to Harriet Jordan for the, creating the quiz and running it, and Susie Chosid for her work with the program design and this morning's Zoom session. If you're interested in reading more about this topic, there is the book that has been mentioned uh, called Fathers in Jane Austen by I.P. Duckfield. It's in the Jazza Library, and it was the inspiration for the focus on the theme of the failings and the foibles of these fathers. So I'd now like to hand over to Susanna Fullerton, our Jazza president, to wrap up and conclude our session. Thank you, Susanna. Thank you, Julie, and thank you again to all of the presenters for giving us some really intriguing fathers to further consider. And of course, what uh, talks like those do is send you back to the novels yet again to uh, read once more the wonderful works of Jane Austen. Julie asked if I would just say a few words about uh, some of the fathers who are sort of not there in the novels. And it has to be said that Jane Austen really is in many ways a serial murderer. She has killed off so many fathers before the novels even begin. And when you consider the age of some of the characters, I know that generally life expectancy was shorter then than it is now. But when you consider the age of young men like Darcy and Bingley, both in their 20s, Mr Wickham in his 20s, so many of these characters are lacking fathers. Jane Austen has ruthlessly killed off those fathers before the novel even begins. So Darcy, Bingley, Wickham, uh, the Thorpe children in Northanger Abbey, uh, John Dashwood, Mr Willoughby, Colonel Fitzwilliam, Mr Collins, he's only a young man in his 20s, his father has died, the Knightley brothers have no father, Captain Wentworth and his sister, Henry and Mary Crawford, the Miss Steeles, those Ward sisters at the start of Mansfield Park, Edward Ferrers, Jane Fairfax, Mr Rushworth, Lady Susan, young Anne de Berg. There are very, very few characters in Jane Austen's novels who actually have living fathers. Now, what Jane Austen is clearly doing is getting rid of extraneous characters. She's not interested in controlling parents in the background unless they're going to play a very important part in her plot, as General Tilney obviously does. So she gets rid of all these extra parents and, you know, she wants Mr Darcy and Mr Bingley to be wealthy. And of course, they would not have control of their own wealth were their fathers actually living. So she ruthlessly disposes of them before Pride and Prejudice even begins. So it really is interesting to consider how many of the major characters and many minor ones in the novels are fatherless and quite often motherless as well. So Jane Austen only keeps those characters that she feels will be useful to her uh, in the course of the plot, the development of the hero or the heroine, uh, whatever it might be. She also occasionally has some very absent fathers. Uh, Catherine Morland does have a father and he's produced a very large family, but he's absent from almost all of the book. He gives his daughter a bit of money, tells her to keep good accounts when she goes off to Bath, uh, and then really he only puts in a brief appearance right at the very end of the novel. So he is a very absent father in the book. Again, because Catherine is going to learn and grow up when she is away from her parents and in the hands of uh, sort of guardian parents like Mr and Mrs Allen. <laughs> 
And then we do have one father who is alive but doesn't have a single word to say in the novel, and that is the father of Harriet Smith who is, of course, a bastard. So Harriet's father, we hear, has made provision economically for her to attend Mrs. Goddard's school, but clearly he's ashamed of this illegitimate child, and he puts in no appearance as a father in the novel whatsoever. We do hear right at the end of the book that he is a respectable tradesman. But what his, uh, his position does in the book is give our wonderful heroine, Emma, the chance to fantasize that, you know, maybe Harriet is the daughter of some nobleman or, you know, uh, has, has very illustrious parentage indeed. And Emma's daydreams are cut ruthlessly down to size by Jane Austen, who just makes the father a respectable tradesman. So I think it is also very interesting while we look at all these fallible and, and on the whole very poor fathers in Jane Austen to also think of the dead ones and the influence that they have on the novels and the absent ones like uh, Harriet Smith's father in Emma. So we've had lots to think about today, and I would like to end by saying a very big thank you to Julie Sweeten, who has put the programme together and liaised with all the speakers, uh, persuaded people to give talks. I know it very well indeed how challenging that can sometimes be. So a very big thank you to, Ju uh, to you, Julie, for organising our study morning and uh, what the committee is doing is now giving a little bit of thought to future study mornings or study days. We always used to hold these events at the Roseville Church Hall. They took the whole day. People would bring their own lunch. There would be a lot of fun with different quizzes and very interactive discussions around a table. And Zoom does not really allow us to do that same sort of interaction that we used to have in the church hall. Also, when we held the study days at Roseville Church, everybody paid their 20 or $25 to attend. And of course, with it being held free on Zoom, that is all free. And it means Jazza makes no money from this particular event. So what we're sort of thinking is, you know, we're very aware that members in New Zealand, around Australia, uh, can't come to actual study days at the church hall. But maybe what we should be doing in future is making sure that every second study day is a live event at Roseville and every alternate study day is one on Zoom where members living at a distance from Sydney can also manage to attend. But remember, of course, that the excellent papers given at study days are all, uh, well, most of them are published in Chronicle, our wonderful uh, journal put together by our fabulous editor, Ruth Williamson. And so those members who miss it uh, will be able to read, you know, all the different papers in our journals. And of course, this has been recorded. So thank you to Cheryl for doing that. And uh, so people can watch it later if they were not available this morning. So lots for your committee to think about. Don't forget my plea at the beginning. Uh, we would love to have suggestions for next year's big anniversary year. 250 years since Jane Austen was born and the world became a better place in which to live. So we would love to have suggestions. Please send them in to us, send in suggestions of possible speakers. Uh, we really would be, you know, would love to hear from you. So a very big thanks again to everyone involved in making today happen. Fabulous to see so many people. We had about 100 people attending today, which is really, really good. And I look forward to seeing many of you for the April meeting when our fabulous American speaker, Siri James, will be talking to us about a rather unknown love affair that Jane Austen had as a young lady. So lots to look forward to in the rest of our jazzy year. Thanks, everyone, and bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, bye for all. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.